All right, well, I think we got a critical mass. Um, welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, we've got a, a very special day today and a very special guest that I've been um, looking forward for, for many months um, to introduce to you all. Doesn't, doesn't really need an introduction because you, you know who he is, but um, um, for basic housekeeping before we get to that, um, in honor of our guest today, our GME color is crimson. <laughs> um, Peter has many shades of, of red. Um, crimson was his past life now. Wildcat red is his current life um, up in being a Davidson um, resident. So um, you have to get used to that, that subtle difference in your shade now. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great um, accomplishments of our program over the past four years has been to bring a man who I think is not only one of the great um, teachers, the great um, technical surgeons and great um, international figure, but also just such a great person and human and mentor. Um, and in a very short period of time, he's been a very important mentor to many of us, including myself, um, Jeff Niesel. And we, um, we celebrate now the anniversary of, a, of a, what turned out to be a very fateful breakfast at um, a relatively humble restaurant Toast up in Davidson, where we finalized the deal to bring, um, bring this gentleman to, to, um, to Charlotte um, to be a part of all of our lives. But um, Peter Waters is a native of New York. Um, actually, you may not have known that he was a basketball player. Um, I, I found that to be very, very reassuring and very, um, and very inspiring. Um, like all the great ones, was, a, was an athlete, at least had an interest in it. Um, Peter did his, his training um, um, and worked at Harvard System and for many years was the surgeon in chief at um, Boston Children's Hospital. Um, we were just hearing an anecdote from John Hall. John Hall was um, one of the great legend, legendary um, orthopedic patriarchs at Harvard who um, took um, this um, gentleman to uh, a concert by um, Yo-Yo Ma, who we heard last night up at Wake Forest, some of us. But, um, but Peter was the John Hall professor at Harvard. And um, I can't think of a greater honor. All my, my buddies that trained at Harvard just went on and on about John Hall and what a great guy he was. Um, Peter, as you would expect, is a member of all the appropriate societies. He's been president of most of them, um, been president of the Society of, um, for Surgery of the Hand, also at POSNA, and um, great mentor to our pediatric colleagues as well as our hand team. Um, he has um, over 200 publications, um, has been invited guests internationally and in most of the great institutions of the world, but certainly a, a household name in, in the, the world of congenital hand surgery. Um, so, um, it's a great tribute to Glenn Gaston and his team, Team Hand, who I know are, are loud and proud here on the call today, um, to have Peter join their midst. And Glenn was a very important part of, of recruiting Peter to um, Charlotte, um, as were Brian Brighton and Brian Scannell and the Peach team. Um, Stacy Nicholson is probably the only one outside of MSKI as excited as we are about having Peter here on the pediatric team as well. And that's already born fruit. So Peter's just started this fall, but already has a giant impact. And um, one of the, the key things in Peter's past is that he was led the surgical leadership forum for the Harvard Business School. Um, so today we're going to hear about um, mentoring and being mentored. And um, Peter couldn't be more excited to welcome you formally to Charlotte. And I um, look forward to your talk. Hey, yeah, thank you. Very, very, very generous uh, of you. And uh, you know how much I hold everybody in high esteem and how honored I am. Uh, to be here. If it's okay, I'm going to share a screen and get going. And so, you know, uh, hopefully you got a thumbs up. You can see that okay? Good. Okay. So, um, T mentioned kind of where I most recently uh, come from, still have a foot in the door, uh, where I am, uh, you know, uh, have moved to, and, and, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about the why. Um, but I have been very excited about this place um, ever since we started talking about this possibility. I just think there's immense opportunity here. Um, there's lots of things I could have talked about. The, the educational team asked me to talk about uh, leadership and followership. And, and I, I do this understanding that there are great, great leaders, uh, some more accomplished than me, uh, here and, and on the Zoom and a part of the teams here. Um, so, so please excuse a little bit of, uh, you know, my taking on this topic, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you on a journey a little bit of what I've learned in the last three decades of literally studying this and, and trying to understand this. Um, let me just see if I can make this go. 
So um, the first is I'm going to acknowledge some recent people in this. So uh, the guy on the right there is uh, retired Major um, Frank Kearney, who uh, taught me a lot at the Thayer Leadership School at West Point um, uh, about five years ago. And, and I actually credit Frank with reintroducing into my mindset followership and, and how important that is um, as we kind of probed the crossover between military leadership and followership in healthcare. And there's, there were lots of business people there. And, and good fortune, Dr. Lothler is going to go up and, and uh, experience what they have to offer. And again, also most recently, uh, uh, this is retired Colonel Kevin Farrell at a leadership uh, program that I participated in at Gettysburg. Um, and I had, hope, had been hoping Dr. Shu would uh, take uh, join me in that journey. But Kevin introduced the concept of what he called the three C's, which is leadership's all about courage and character and competence. And, and he said, you know, competence is the one you can teach. The other two are the most important. Um, and, and then in discussion, he and, I, he and I came to a fourth C, which is uh, commitment. And it turns out Kevin just lives down the road here, and I hope someday he'll he'll come up and, and share some of his thoughts uh, beyond just that. The other is just to acknowledge really what got me here. You guys are great. I love being in here. I have immense respect for you. Uh, but this is my youngest granddaughter. This is my oldest granddaughter. This is my in-between granddaughter. Uh, so Jana, Izzy, and Alan, and they are why we're here. But like in leadership and followership, this is the leader of my life uh, sitting there in a the minute, uh, my wife, Janet, and T and Jeff joked that, you know, she was their greatest recruiter. Uh, but we are very happy to be here. It simplifies our life. It brings us together. It's a great time of life for us to be doing what we're doing. And you've provided me with opportunity to do other things. So let's start a little bit. I, I've been a firm believer that education is transformational. Uh, education transformed my life, um, you know, from college, uh, medical school truly transformed my life as I think it probably did all of yours. But these institutions, I've gotten degrees or certificates from them and, and from others along the way. And each time I learn something more, and sometimes I don't know how when to use it until years and years later. But I sent these folks and more out of uh, Boston to similar programs for the same reason. And so I encourage you to continue to learn, especially in this space, and we'll talk a bit more about it, because um, I think it'll help transform your life in a very positive way. I got to start at the beginning a little bit, and I got to acknowledge some folks. This hand team is outstanding. These people have embraced me, welcomed me, uh, you know, Glenn, Brian, Dan, Chris, Julie, it, it's an honor to, to be a part of your team and see how I can help. Similarly, the pediatric orthopedic people I have great respect for. Um, and, and, I, and, and I just love being able to be a bridge uh, in between. And there are, there are leaders in all of these pictures already, and they're gonna be, uh, take on more and more leadership roles as time goes by. I have to acknowledge the, you know, the, the top tier. And so you know, uh, Bruce and Jeff and, and T have let me come into this kind of complex matrix of Atrium Health in North Carolina. And, and hopefully I can do it in a seamless, uh, helpful way. And also to recognize you have this other opportunity with Wake Forest and complex matrices are hard. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but to acknowledge uh, Andy and up at Wake, but also to put in a kind of a non-suit picture, because I'll tell you, leadership's also about fun. It's gotta be important. You gotta have impact, but I'll tell you, you gotta enjoy it. You just gotta enjoy it. And so, uh, that's just another little tip, but I thank you for letting me come here and, and do what I do. Nine years ago, when I took this picture in the Davidson bookstore, I did not know I was going to live in Davidson, but I love this picture. And part of the reason why I love it, uh, as I'll talk near the end, is my dad died when I was young. But aspire to inspire before you expire is like a, a core value to me. And all of you can, is, can really inspire other people. Everybody you work with every day, they look up to you. They're impressed with who you are and what you've accomplished and where you've gone to school. And, and so inspire them to be better. 
inspire them to do well, even when you're not around uh, and, and build your teams and build other leaders and, and be generational. And so this is the generation of orthopedic surgery or of all of academic medical or all of medicine, right? And so this is our cycle of life. And I'm kind of near the end of my cycle of this life, right, as a senior person. But, but leadership has trouble and has opportunity in all of these places. And I'm going to touch a little bit on kind of what we've done, but, but young leaders need to, young attendings need to be developed. And mid-career people as emerging leaders need help. And senior leaders need to see the way with dignity. Uh, and the fellows got to grow up and they're going to take on immense responsibility while fellows, but as, as they move to young attendings. And most importantly, the residents as you get out of medical school. So I'm gonna to touch on two things here. The first is you're all leaders and you're all followers and you have to know how to go back and forth. Recently, I was back home in Syracuse at a Hall of Fame induction for one of my former teammates. And it was fascinating. He said to me, he gave me one of the greatest honors of, uh, that I can think of. He said, Peter, you gave up more of your individual stuff to make us better and to help us be a championship team. And, and I took that as a, as a great sign of really, in a sense, who I wanted to be and hopefully have tried to be. We all emphasize educational content and technical expertise. I still worry about it. We got complex surgery tomorrow. Julie and I have been talking about it all week. How are we gonna do this? We brought in Glenn, we brought in Ellis, we brought in Brian, we're gonna talk about it more. But you gotta, you gotta worry your entire career, especially when you're young about educational content and technical expertise, it can consume you. But I will tell you emotional intelligence will make or break you. you. You have to focus on this, especially now. So let's touch on emotional intelligence for a second. Sorry, I clipped one too many. But how self-aware are you? Most of us are kind of nerdy, right? What's your social skills? Can you get along with people? Can you self-regulate, right? Can you self-regulate? That was my hardest one, to be honest. My mother told me like, you, you gotta figure this out, boy. How motivated are you? I'm not worried about the drive of most of us and how empathic are you? I know you all care, but how empathic do people know you are? Because that makes a big difference. And I'll tell you, as we'll get to COVID a little bit, that made a huge difference. I changed my leadership style to be certain. Everybody understood. I understood how hard it was. So the first thing we did, because you, you can talk about all this stuff, but you got to do things about it. The first thing that I did was um, as a part of this master's of uh, science and education I got recently is we developed a leadership seminar for surgical fellows. So in their year in plastic surgery, urology, orthopedics, sports medicine, otolaryngology, et cetera, at children's, we knew they were going to get great educational content and technical expertise, but we were worried when they step out the door especially in the 21st century, how well can they lead their teams in the clinic, in the OR, research teams? How prepared are they to do this? And we decided we would buy Goldman's premise, you can teach this. And so we set out to teach this. We're in year five of this. And then a resident said, hey, Dr. Waters, will you do this with us? And so I literally at 6 a.m. had a leadership session with a Harvard resident this morning but it's, it's really important. And we set this up so they do this just before they become senior residents and take on more responsibility. And this was an essay piece that they wrote about why it was important in their residency. Because we're on a progression of life and learning and execution that starts with Al figuring out there's a ball and Izzy figuring out there's a club and a ball. And me really worried about the technical expertise of how to putt. And that stuff's simple. Over on the right, there's a whole bunch of us in the operating room doing a really complex operation. And we have to shift from leading and following, but we have to execute. And, and we gotta be really good in our communication and in our uh, task management and in our leadership and in our teamwork in the, in the OR. And this is the typical thing, and this is a dilemma. And, and I purposely made it a, an older white male myself, but we have in the OR, our role is surgeon, which is our primary responsibility, educator, which we all take very, very seriously, and actually team leader. It's kind of our room. 
And, and we got to do all those. And, and even when it's a simple operation, that's a lot. And so sometimes you got to delegate. But when the operation goes south, it's really hard because you got to hyper focus like this gentleman is. And suddenly kind of the team may be spinning a little bit and disengaged. And times are changing, like in the three people in scrub, who's the surgeon there? You know, we, we can guess, but, but literally in a sense, who's the surgeon? And this is how immensely difficult it can be. This is Joe Murray at, at, in the Harvard Longwood area performing the first kidney transplant for which he won the Nobel Prize. That's a long time ago, but look at that room. Like, how do you keep control of that room? How do you lead those teams? And the teams are changing, right? So this University of Rochester first all-female class in their surgical program in 2011. And we know all about diversity. And this is really important. And, and, and some of this is long, long overdue. And most of it has to happen. And we just need to make our way fairly <clears throat> and do this well. This is EPOSNA combined meeting European North American 2017. This was the largest group of female pediatric orthopedists in the world ever assembled. And, and this is great. This is great. There's some real choices in equity, division, uh, diversity, and inclusion. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, although I've had some roles uh, in this. But you have to decide whether it's an investigative, punitive culture or whether it's an aspirational culture of fairness and opportunity and education and learning. And I bet you already know which side I'm on. But I had to do the side of investigative and putative at different times. My aspiration, our aspiration should always be to help people learn and to help people get better and help people literally every day being their better or ideally their best self to work. And that's what you have to inspire, aspire to inspire them to do. If you haven't read Goldman stuff, this is Harvard Business Review. There's books. Great stuff, really smart man, really well-organized writer, and Cotter as well. But, but you gotta lead change. In the, in the end, we can talk about this, but we gotta, we gotta make a difference. Urgency helps, creating urgency helps. You gotta build a team. You have to know where you're going. If you can't communicate, nobody's gonna buy in. They're just not gonna do it. You gotta do that. If you don't empower people to do their job well, when you're not around, that's a problem. The best leaders have people who do their job well when they're not around. You got to figure out some short-term wins. Like don't go to like build the building, start out picking a couple apples and make your way. You have to be relentless. This is long haul. There's going to be ups. There's going to be downs. You got to make change stick. It just can't be like another marketing initiative that sounds great and disappears and nothing happened. COVID provided us enormous opportunity to shift a little bit in the academic medical centers. It also has stressed us to the breaking point. Thomas Friedman, a great writer, said, you know, we need great leaders like right now. And, and I couldn't agree more, and we still do. And you have great leaders here. And the Notre Dame uh, Center for Ethical Leadership talked about how you lead during times of crisis. And they asked me to give a talk on leading in times of crisis at the IPOS meeting in December. And I started the talk with, if you don't know how to lead in a non-crisis, there's no way you can lead in a crisis. If you can't run your OR team through a trigger thumb, when, when they start bleeding through an axilla, you're in trouble, right? And so you got to know how to do it when it's simple before you do it when it's hard. <clears throat> what Smink talked about is, Sometimes we're so consumed with what we're going to do or how we're going to do it, or really getting so caught up in who's going to do it, that we forget literally the most important part, which is why are we doing it? I found in our place, COVID helped us understand why. Most people went back to why they went to medical school and, and understood their values and then moved out to how and what and who. You got to know the why. <clears throat> And some of the why means you got to look in the mirror. And this gets a little uncomfortable. This morning session with the residents was all about what I'm going to talk about next. We are data driven people. But what you can fail in emotional intelligence is you can take one piece of data instead of a lot, and you can attach some meaning 
And the worst is if you attach personal meaning to it, like I don't like that person, I don't like what they just did, et cetera. And you make some assumptions on that meeting and you draw some conclusions and then you create a belief system and you start taking action on it. This ladder of inference, Bob Keegan up at the uh, education school at Harvard uh, taught me, and it's enormously important. You gotta spread out acquiring data and then make your way. And you gotta, and I'll get back to this again, you gotta stay professional. So what we did we, in orthopedics and surgery and sports medicine, then across the hospital, we had everybody take a, a psychological complex profile. And you can, you can poo-hoo this. I've taken a number of these over three decades. The good news is I've changed somewhat. The bad news is I'm still the same guy. Like we all fit somewhere in this box, although it's not like one spot on the line. It's actually a complex matrix that you fit into. And this is my hand surgery team. And, and one color is when you're not stressed and one color is when you're stressed. But if you look at this, we have the same values. We have the same mission, we have the same goals, but we're really different, really different. But what I loved about this, when I saw this and we went over it as a team, when you put all of those people on one sheet of paper, they make a whole. And so you gotta accept people who are different from you, who have the same values, who make you better. And so you gotta be willing to look and this platform of psychological safety matters. The others you gotta know, what sort of leader you are. And Goldman goes through this and they're all different types. So you can understand how to lead, but also how to understand what your tendency is. And in certain situations, that tendency is not gonna help you. And so you gotta do something else or you gotta say to somebody else, you do this. You know, periodically Jim Castor and I would go, hey, hey Jim, hey Peter, I don't think they're gonna listen to me, but I think they'll listen to you. And that's all that matters. So can you take this on? Thich Nhat Khan, a, a Vietnamese Buddhist monk, just passed away uh, this month. Uh, he taught me and my friends a lot about mindfulness. He westernized some of these thoughts, but self-regulation, self-awareness, empathy, you got to bring that to the table. You got to stop the action, reflect, and then understand what's going to be best for us here. And each one of you is going to have a natural tendency of any of these leadership styles. And so you should know a little bit who you are, and then you should try and figure out, can I learn some other styles or can I know the styles of other people? And can I figure out which situation it really matters in? Uh, Jeff Newell and I have the, both have the same favorite book, First 90 Days by Watkins, but you gotta know what you should be doing and how you should be doing. And if you bring the wrong leadership style or you bring the wrong plan, it's all going to fail. And, and what was the point of failure? Like, there's no point in failure. If you're going to fail, they'll fail quickly. And, and some of you have to go from being in scrubs to wearing a suit. And some of you only have one role or the other. And some of you have seven roles. But they're different leadership styles for different places. And don't poo-hoo how important that is. John Kennedy taught us, you know, leadership and learning is indispensable. I go back to education will transform you. It's indispensable. You also have to do it in a way that people, whether it's educational content, technical expertise, or some of the things that we're talking about, that they can retain it and retrieve it later. I love when I pull something from way back when to this moment and understand that's why they taught me. Now I get it. But you want your people to understand this book. If you haven't read it, it's short. It's immensely powerful. And you have to know how you learn. So you take the Cobb learning style or something like that. But most of us are accommodators, we're doers. But what we do is we do something, you do an operation, you reflect maybe by yourself or with your peers. You think about how we might change that. You redo it probably a little different way, right? That's surgery, innovative, iterative change. Sometimes you really get innovative and you completely change it. Most of us live in accommodators. The problem is that some of you are theory people. And if I bring judgment that my way is the right way and how I learn and how I go about it, I will miss out what you're going to bring to my team. And that's a major mistake. And that's on me. That's my fault. It's not yours. You're who, you are who you are. I got to recognize your talents. We have to recognize your talents. And unfortunately, this is where we excel. You give us a problem. You put us in a room. We will figure it out. 
look at SAT scores, MCATs, board scores, et cetera. And this has great value in certain places, but it also means sometimes you're all alone. And in the modern world of teams, that IQ is really, really important thinking and planning. But in the end, you got to learn how to collaborate. And so that's where I really believe learning to improve your emotional intelligence is very important. Even if you never have a job title that says chief of anything, you are in charge of your operating room, of your clinic, of your business, of your life, right? This is modern learning, case-based learning, team-based learning. This is what's going on in our schools, our medical schools, et cetera. The reason is, is because it's affected. This is, this is my team at Boston Children's. Very different ages, very different races, very different genders, very different prism personality profiles, very different Cobb learning styles, very different people. Important, impactful, have fun. Never, never underestimate optimism, smiling, gathering, connecting. Michael Lewis, Adam Grant, they told us stars are overrated. You know, stars are important. You got to have talent. Don't get me wrong. But role players, they're underrated. And, and groups outperform individuals in complex situations. And surgery is really complex. Academic medical centers are really complex. This is a great exercise if you've never done it. Take a piece of paper and put a dot in the middle that's you. And, and that's, that's your universe. And then try and figure out for whatever it is. So like me, when I came here, I put a dot that was Charlotte right, for professional, and then try and figure out who are your mentors, who are your peers, who are, your, who are you mentoring, but understand over time, the people you were mentoring mentor you. Don Bay, who I started out mentoring, mentors me. That, that's the beauty of life. Glenn Gaston is mentoring me in different ways, the same way I am him. But how big is your universe? And can you go across complex systems, right, you know? Doctors Loeffler and Shu in their osteointegration, you know, across systems. Can you reach, you know, for um, Mormon and Komen across institutions? Can you reach across the country? Can you reach across the world? And, th and this place is full of talented people who do that in, in arthroplasty and in spine and in sports and in trauma. It's just really important. But as the young people do this, or as you change, build a new universe? Can you make your universe more three-dimensional, four-dimensional? Because you got to be able to manage conflict. You know, I wish it was just easy. I really do. Like, I wish marriage was like, you know, Cinderella. It's not. I wish it was easy. But there's both danger and opportunity and conflict. We're, we're very status quo people. We won't change unless we're kind of forced to a little bit. So COVID, for example, was a very dangerous time. It's still a very dangerous time, but it provided us with opportunity if we take advantage of it. And, and in there, what can happen, this was my childhood, like my brothers and I, my sister, the whole neighborhood, this is what we did all the time. This is modern conflict, right? Disengagement is death to an initiative, completely disengaged. You gotta bring everybody in that room in the game. I think this is the same. Like what you're saying to people is what's on my phone is more important than you. That's a bad message. If you can't hide your phones, hide your computers, look people in the eye. This is really hard. We had for a while a cost saving initiative and a growth initiative at the same time. It, it'll never work. You can't make the canoe go in two directions. The, the, what happens is the boat splits and everybody drowns or you just exhaust yourself and you go crazy. So you gotta know where you're going. People know I took up rowing late in life. I love rowing. I, I, I love Lake Norman to row on. But you better understand that that team that's rowing, your job is to take them to the right place, not the danger, but to opportunity. So again, in conflict, positive change. Don't go negative, stay positive, stay optimistic. You gotta be curious. You gotta ask people who are not buying in, like, what's the problem here? What am I missing? You gotta listen. You got to listen. Um, you got to share your point of view. They won't trust you unless you tell them what's going on. The very best adults can do is be transparent with one another. Very best. They got to know you're empathic. They have to know you care. You And honestly, you have to care. You can't fake it. 
And then you got to know your own conflict threshold and, and hopefully you can mature. You know, my mother told me at first grade, I think my conflict threshold is much higher now than it was. But I can tell you, there are times where I turn into an Irishman again and I got to control it. You don't want this. There are times you have to, you just don't have any choice. There are times you have to. But what you want as often as you can is to take this to this so everybody, everybody gets better. All right. And there's lots of ways to coach. There's lots of ways to lead. You can be upfront and personal, eye contact. You know, you can see and purposeful that there's a, a wake guy in here and a local guy. You know, a bunch of you are roll tide people. And, and a lot of you, as Glenn tells me, are Georgia people. But, you know, sometimes you do it from a distance and you just quietly observe and, and you try and learn without making yourself a part of the picture until you have to. And you got to get data. We're analytical people. You got to get data. Your opinion, your belief doesn't matter as much unless it's backed up by data. So I'm going to turn on one of your local heroes uh, a little bit in a, for a short clip out of a great video that's worth seeing. Over the years, what would you say are the most important uh, lessons that you wish you could have learned? The very first thing is that you know, in order to get better, you change your ways. And you can change the ways you may look bad or you may fail. And at West Point, I learned that failure was never a destination. The other thing is that you're not going to get there alone. You have to surround yourself with good people and learn how to listen. We could spend all morning on that. Back to role players and stars and, and way back when, and he's grown and he's learned. But you have people who are so talented that too often it's all about him, you know that person. You know, he threw Westbrook under the bus again just last week, right? Local guy, man, I would play with him every day of the week. Important. They're really good, impactful. They win championships. They're having fun. They, they meet all three of my criteria. Great leader. The other thing is you got to be willing to be tested, okay? So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tested. So in 2010, we started a program for simulation, and we tried to see, can we get outside of the technical expertise and move into what I'm talking about? So I'm going to play a little video of this high simulation femur fracture in which they videotaped us and they scored us and it was nursing and anesthesia and surgeons and and they made things happen to this mannequin that we had to respond to. So a very short clip, Claude Specker's got a Duke, Duke hat on for you. But Mike was acting the role of attending and I was acting the role as his fellow. And this is the first time we did it. But they suddenly let a bleeder go here and the pressure starts dropping. And we and we just thought we were cruising on this plating of a femur, which was our job, and suddenly we're not. And we gotta figure out how to stop the bleeder and take care of it and also keep the room engaged and, and talk to the anesthesiologist and talk to the nurses. And at the end of it, they sat us in a room and they quote unquote debriefed us, but they scored us. And so you gotta stay calm and you gotta do your job, but you actually gotta help everybody else do their job. And sometimes that's critically important to the patient. So we started building a program of team skills in our simulation program. And part of my drive was I was aware of data that not everybody else was. There was a subgroup of us. But for example, we were finding an increased risk for wrong site, wrong procedure, wrong patient in our institution. Like, really? Are you kidding me? Right? And, and you got you to gotta get to the platform before it's on fire, right? Or you got to use the platform that's starting on fire to create urgency. This, this we use to create some urgency. So we set up a program of simulation, again, short vignettes in which we made things go wrong with the teams, right? And so we had a simple fracture, for example, but it, it had a wrong site consent. It had an inaccurate consent. It had a drug reaction. It had stuff that happened. And we video recorded. And then we changed roles. Lyle McKaylee here is the most senior sports surgeon at our place. And many think one of the you know, premier early leaders of pediatric orthopedic surgery. And Ben Hayworth is a, is a great you know, early mid-career sports person. But that, Ben's the attending. Lyle's the fellow. This is being recorded. We're being watched. Uh, and, and you can see they're taking it seriously. The nurses are, the anesthesia folks. 
What I learned in basketball from my coaches, and you probably learn in different ways, you got to practice live. If you can't play live in a tough game if you don't practice live. Again, you can't lead a complex situation if you can't lead a simple situation. So we practice live. And this was one of the outcomes of all that. But if this is just a placard on the wall, it, it lasts about six weeks and it disappears. And it's just another thing on the wall, right? We learned where we were having troubles, but we learned actually what we really had to do is build a better culture, build better teams, because we know that team performance, you got all sorts of ways you can have errors and simulation can teach you and can help you. But we felt like we got to go in the OR and learn. So we started this real event learning and analysis real to look at it. And as you go up the pyramid, it gets harder and more people get interested in the way at the top. But it's really important because mastery, can you bend the curve? Can you get people more proficient faster? So this was me again with these uh, tools out of Scotland for anesthesiologists, nurses, anesthetists, wheels into wheels out, audio visual recording. They recorded 25 of my operations and scored us before we moved it out. And we moved it out in steps. And the last step most recently has been the spine team. And I think they're moving to the cardiac surgery team. And you got scored. And the American College of Surgeons now uses these scoring tools uh, across their educational programs. They've been validated. The list of publications is a mile long. But when we looked at the scores, we did pretty good. But it was a kind of select group, right? Like I'm trying to lead this initiative. And I'm telling everybody it's important. But we learned actually our anesthesia people were not as engaged. And it was probably my or our fault. But we also learned there were some outliers who really engaged. And so we then set a program up with the chief of anesthesia and all of them more engaged, including teachers and the nurses and anesthesia folks to work together with the surgeons. Fortunately, we found that our learning simulation made certain that we had right patient, right procedure, right sign site, right consent. But we weren't so good at contingency planning because we didn't talk about stuff well in advance or before it happened and didn't have the right equipment at times or didn't have the next thing we needed if it went south. Because again, this is what we do well, but it makes us vulnerable. And we do this really well. We're, if we're an accommodator, you sit, you reflect, you think about it, but you're all alone. And sometimes you're really good one-on-one -on -one and then people on the left, one of them's open, one of them's a little aggression, people on the right's locked in, eye contact, got a smile, trying to engage in a positive way. But you got to get everybody involved. You got to go beyond the dyads. You got to get to the whole team. You got to get back to this. Good leaders, a good listener. A couple final points. Surgeons are at the highest level of efficiency and productivity. When I first started getting my first major leadership job, I turned to my mentor and I said, it's driving me crazy. It's driving me crazy. I can't get this done in the time I have. This is driving me crazy. And he just laughed. And he said the following, you cannot speed up listening. And then he said, if you don't listen, you're going to fail. Your teams are going to fail. You got to be patient. You got to listen. You learn a lot if you listen. Final pearls. I just finished another book about Auschwitz. If you haven't read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, read it. I think I've read it five times. These people survived under his leadership and other people's leadership because they looked out for one another. They took care of one another in a situation I can't even imagine. I just read the volunteer, similar thing. I can't even imagine, can't imagine. But what he said is it's not about happiness. It's about meaning. We live a life that we get to do very, very meaningful things. Very fortunate. We have great teams. This is when I was leaving Boston. Don Bay, been with me since medical school. Ray is a scrub tech. That mother, I took care of her when they're 12. I took care of her daughter when she was 13. We get to connect with people over a lifetime. We get to do important, impactful things. Never underestimate what we get to do. We're going to do this twice tomorrow. You know, I could have talked to you about this stuff. You would have fallen asleep. But, you know, this is, Glenn, this is the Buck Gramp go. But we get to do important things. We get to make a difference in people's lives. We're blessed to do the work that we get to do. It's all about progress, not perfection. You know, you just can't get to perfection. If you look at any point on the curve, you may be going downhill. If you look at the whole curve, you're making your way, right? Don't, don't score yourself minute to minute. Keep the vision. Make it 50 steps away, 25 steps away, 10 steps away, five steps away. When you get to about three steps, everybody wants in the game. That's okay. Don't worry about the credit. Worry about getting the job done.
Not every idea works, so fail quickly. Stay the course, unless you're on the wrong course and then change. Co-create culture. It takes all of us to create culture. Always be professional. The worst situations I've ever seen in my life or my career is when people get personal. Never get personal. You know, tell people you don't like their behavior. Don't tell people you don't like them. Say yes. This is the thing I said a million times. Say yes. Then figure out how you don't have to do it, how all of you can do it. We do exhausting work, totally exhausting. Elle runs herself ragged every day. I run myself ragged many days. You got to wake up with enthusiasm. You got to come to work with optimism. When you brush your teeth at night and it didn't go so well, reflect. Think about it. Learn. When you wake up in the morning, the guy from Johnson & Johnson through the time crisis told me when he brushed his teeth during that time, he said, good morning, champ. My people laugh periodically. They'd say, good morning, champ. You're good morning, champ. You got to lead everybody that day. Final message from my dad. He taught all of us it's later than you think for all of us. My wife told me, hey, it's later than we think. We got to get to Davidson. We got to get to Charlotte. It's later than you think in your professional lives. If you want to lead teams, if you want to do important stuff, if you want to have more impact, now's the time. Learn, move on. I'm really happy to be here. I thank you for allowing me to be a part of your team. Thank you so much. T, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, Peter, Peter, thank you so much for that. And um, your last comment um, really resonated with me. You know, it's later than you think. I shared that with um, Dave Dedick and Chris Kading, two other leaders, um, recently at a meeting in Montana. And um, the whole rest of the week, every toast was, it's later than you think. <laughs> so, um, so that comment, um, question for you. Um, um, you and I are baby boomers. And um, we come from a different generation, a different mindset, perhaps, than, than some of the folks that we're educating who fall more into the millennial um, group. How, um, what techniques, understandings, um, methods um, do you think have been important to you in reaching across that generational divide um, as you're educating the next group? So uh, the first is, I would say, no matter what name you put on it, if you read like at one point I read all of the uh, presidential addresses for a kick, you know, that I could find from the Hand Society or from uh, AOS. But th that's a cycle where everybody goes through a process and, and they embrace who they have been and who they are and how they got there. And, and they sometimes uh, look a little askance at the next generation and they don't have the same value work ethic or et cetera. So we have to understand our, our part in any generational thing. And Vern Tolo gave a great talk about, you know, crossing generations and, and how you do that. Um, to me, I, I think the first is just understanding every generation has the same value. That's why they chose medicine, right? But they come from a different place and there's some things they can teach us. And then the other is like, we go nowhere without building the next generation. So when I would say to people, when they come look at our place, I'd say, look and see how well we take care of our young and our mid-career people. It's, it's really important and go to other places and see what they do. And, and the people whose names you don't know right now, I hope you're gonna know their names as you go along in your career. So I think it's also on us to, to build those leaders. And part of that is coming to understand, as Bill Russell said, rather than be understood. I think it's really important to understand people and listen. As an example, one of the things I learned, the amount of work burden with the computers that modern day residents have is enormous. I took my pen, I took my brain, I took my personality, I walked through four Harvard hospitals and I wrote a note and I left. And sometimes in a day I'd go walk through many of them. That's all I do is take my pen and myself. I didn't even have to take my ID. Right, I get in. The, I could do that. The burden for them of security EMR is off the charts. That we didn't have to. So I learned a lot listening. That's an example of trying to everybody come to understand mutually. Similarly, thing you know, sometimes can people can you know look at old white men and and not understand what they had to go through to get where they are, et cetera. So I think all sides in this time have to listen to each other. But my my teammate, college roommate, who's a uh, you know, CEO of a massive company, he said, Peter, I don't really care what you know. 
I care what the people you're training know, because there's no one who's going to take care of me. He said this when he was in his mid-career. They're, they're the people who are going to take care of me. Teach them, because you're going to be too old when I need you. So I, I, that's another just simple answer. I don't know if it answers the question, but I think we have to be compassionate to each other. But I also think we got to coach each other, and we got to mentor each other, and we got to take it seriously. And we got to be certain people are competent. And, and so that, that's sometimes hard. How can you coach properly? You know, talk to Coach K and, and how many times has he changed his coaching style? I was, I was glad to see you used the Blue Devil um, reference there. From <laughs> um, he, um, he has really transformed. And I think that's one of the things. Um, and the, the great scientific leaders that I know are the same way. You know, Russ Warren was always willing to learn from anyone. You mm -hmm. know, if you, if you go to the academy meeting, you always see him out there with his pen and paper reading the posters and trying to learn. And no student's idea was ever a bad idea. It was always some merit. Um, and that I see that with Coach. You know, he's had to transform from the sort of building leadership over a four-year period of time to a great senior-led team to being one and done like California and everybody else. And it's a giant transformation. We probably all need to take notes of that. Hey, Peters, Brian, thank you very much for the talk this morning. Um, you know, we've had lots of challenges. You kind of mentioned a little bit of it with COVID. One of the challenges I think with a lot of leaders and followers have been disengagement. Mm -hmm. um, what are your kind of thoughts on sort of, you know, as we're hopefully, I mean, we're still in this virtual world right now, but of how do we kind of re-engage sort of whether it be learners, whether it be partners, colleagues, um, sort of in this new era uh, currently in or hopefully getting more post COVID, any thoughts? Uh, a couple thoughts, and I and I don't know if they're successful, but I can tell you what I did. Um, the first, I uh, during COVID and now I communicate a lot more. Um, when you get the opportunity, I always found it valuable to walk the halls, you know. So I would walk into clinics when it wasn't my clinic and just say hi to people and check in, and you know, and that was even before I had a title as a person, just to you know connect. And I'd stop in people's operating rooms and. Uh, all sorts of things. But I think connecting and communicating are, are really important. I have used during COVID uh, texting enormously, like I'm sure Glenn and Brian will tell you, I, I text them way more than they probably want me to. Um, and I also try and find some simple things like I, as an example, I started sending pictures of sunsets uh, during COVID time to a lot of people locally, but also nationally just as a way of connecting and, and, and Gaston and those folks, you know, Brian, so they've seen more of the Lake Norman sunsets than they probably ever would want in their lifetime, but just figure out a way to do that. And then the other is do something together, right? So, uh, you know, we would hold the social events all the time for our teams, bowling, you know, ball games, et cetera, do a project together, do, do something together. And, and some of that can be managed remotely where you can do stuff together, but do things together. Because um, then, you, then you, you have this connectivity. That, that, that one word, connectivity, is what has gotten the best teams through COVID, right? And, and that's not our nature, Brian. We, we like to, I mean, I'm, I'm a, like, at best, I'm a social introvert. At worst, I'm an introvert, right? And so you also got to know what energizes and exhausts you. When I do all that connecting, I go home tired, but it's important. You know. Thank you. You know, um, <clears throat> Peter had mentioned uh, the uh, Harvard leadership program that he started with the fellows up there. And just as a, for a couple comments, um, Peter's worked with us and is working with us now to help kind of implement the same program here. Um, so we've had a lot of discussions and just for the residents, um, our plan is likely starting, uh, this next academic year to have sort of a monthly leadership meeting with sort of our senior residents and then potentially some of the other fellows as well. So, um, you know, I, there's no doubt in my mind, Peter, having you here, your impact will, uh, will carry on for many, many years. Um, but we have loved having you here so far and, uh, look forward to getting that program up and off the ground. Thank you, Brian. And, and again, it, it, it won't be my program. It'll be your program. Um, you know, and, and each time, to be honest, we run the session, it's different because it, it takes who's ever in it to run it, but it'll be your program. It, it won't be mine and, and you guys will be great at it, but it's important. I, I, I know from five years now, it's important.
Then we have Team Hand um, here. And Glenn, I don't know if you have comments. You're heavily involved in this work. Yeah, no, I just, Peter, great talk as always. I, I've, it's been wonderful to get to learn a lot from you already. I think another thing uh, you could give a brief comment on that I've heard you talk, it's impacted me already, is you've given me really good advice on uh, implied inference with emails and things like that. And uh, the story about uh, how one of your mentors responded to emails, I think that's a good brief one for the team. All right, that's thank you, Glenn, for bringing that up. And it actually gets a little bit to what I said with Brian, because uh, email is very dangerous. And, and, the, and the reason email is dangerous uh, is that you don't look somebody in the eye. And that's one. And number two, um, there um, you can either uh, assume negative intent or you can assume positive intent. All right. So now I'll do a personal discourse like my wife assumes positive intent on everything she interacts with. And my nature was always to assume negative intent on everybody I interacted with uh, and then try and figure out whether they won my respect, right? Like how stupid is that? But that's that, that was through, you know, we met when we were 19 years of age and fortunately she has taught me. But in email, what happens is people assume negative intent when they read it. They're in isolation, you're in isolation, it's bad. So my mentor said, when email first started coming, three responses, yes, no, see me. That's all he ever wrote, yes, no, see me. He answered every email, he never let one go without answering it, but it was yes, no, see me. Over time, it got a little more than that, but he never got too much into detail in email because he always thought it would be misinterpreted, the intention. So. I would encourage you to assume positive intent with people. That goes back to your millennial versus boomer. Assume positive intent rather than negative intent and, and build out from there. But yes, be careful on email, especially now. Email lasts forever. Ask Hillary Clinton, ask, uh, you know, President Truman at uh, Trump, excuse me, you know, et cetera. It lasts forever. All right, well, Peter, you're a great treasure for our program. Thanks so much for the, um, the discourse this morning. Um, great to see everybody virtually. Um, we just got great news from the Mecklenburg County Commissioners last night that as of the 26th, that they're gonna forego the mask mandate. So I'm hoping that um, early March, we can get back to um, in-person meetings. And um, I'm sorry we couldn't do this one in-person, Peter. This would have been a, a great one to lead that off, but. But we'll get back on course as a, as a program here together and look forward to seeing everybody um, starting in March with the um, with uh, and back in the Mercy Auditorium for Grand Rounds. So great week and look forward to seeing you next week.